I'm Captain Kirk. Fascinating. <laughs> I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I sir. Well, that was different. Yep, rousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, Elysians, chickens and things, to episode 92 of the Muppet Trek podcast. I'm Jarman. And I'm Steve. We're here to compare, contrast, and confer about our two favorite franchises. Jarman, what are those? Those are, of course, the Muppets in Star Trek. And we do one-to-one oh, yeah. reviews in the Muppet Show and Star Trek the Animated Series. And this week, we have a special Muppet Show guest, Linda Carter, and animated series episode, The Time Trap. Ooh. And so, Steve, first tell us about the special Muppet Show guest star, Linda Carter. Who is Linda Carter? Linda Carter, Carter, American (laughs) actress, singer, and all-around performer. She was actually crowned Miss World USA in 1972. I didn't know that. She's most known for being Wonder Woman, as referenced in this episode many times. And that's likely what most of our listeners would know her from, Mm -hmm. as most of her acting credits since then and more recent roles have been small arcs, single-episode cameos, including a cameo at the end of Wonder Woman 1984. And two things we should mention as part of the greater A Play on Nerds family. We have, uh, um, of course, Sky High, which we are, have reviewed recently in our Play on Nerds podcast, where she plays the principal. Principal and, Powers. That's right. And a show that I watched a lot, which is uh, Supergirl. She plays the president of the US USA in Supergirl. So, okay, nice. There you nice. go. <laughs> But what's she up to this week on The Muppet Show? On stage, Kermit introduces Linda Carter, but first, a human sacrifice. <laughs> we find ourselves in an ancient temple, tribal pigs banging drums, leading Janice tied up uh, to a statue. She begins banging two sticks together, beating a rhythm, and is joined by the statue. And this turns into the song A Little Help From My Friends by the Beatles. And I love it. Mm-hmm. The electric mayhem comes and breaks her free, and they make a hasty escape. Um. So Linda makes her way to the stage and she is joined by a band of rubber band men puppets and they perform rubber band man. And Linda has some singing chops. Oh, I man. was impressed. I didn't expect it. Beautiful voice. Yeah. We get a Muppet news flash. A new tomb has been discovered, but a crocodile God will pass a curse on anyone who says his name. The anchor then says the name and is eaten by a crocodile. <laughs> Now we hit next. We hit the rooftops with Floyd Pepper. He performs while my guitar gently weeps from a building scaffolding as people are in the windows living their lives. Kermit introduces Miss Piggy as Wonder Pig. We find ourselves at a house interior with Miss Piggy, whose sister is in a trance, but occasionally makes chicken noises. Uh, the hysteria overtakes the others as a giant chicken looms outside, pecking the, the building viciously. But who will save them? It's Wonder Pig, who grows to enormous sizes and scares away the chicken. Up we up next is a batch of sheep. They start singing a sweet song. It's actually called the Whiff and Poof song. They're picked off one by one by a wolf in sheep's clothes until Super Sheep grabs a gun and takes him out. <laughs> Uh, Linda hits the stage one last time and sings Orange Colored Skies. She's joined by wannabe superhero Muppets from backstage and things explode throughout the number. Backstage this week, the entire thing is that Scooter is taking a correspondence course on how to become a superhero. And so is everybody else. Sam, as usual, bemoans the state of the show, but Linda just loves it. Um, Linda starts rubber band man in her dressing room um, and then she's joined by the remainder of the cast and then she makes her way to stage for the actual number. Um, Beauregard, it comes into Linda's dressing room. Um, it, and this is post the, the Egyptian crocodile thing. And he's trying to tell her not to say it, but she doesn't know what she's not supposed to say. And the anchor says up and says it again and is again attacked by a crocodile. <laughs> uh, Sam is backstage. He's censoring the show. He's writing down dis as he calls it disgusting items. He wants omitted. Um, and then he's just outraged by the rats assisting backstage. Um, as the entire cast gets into the superhero mindset, everyone's trying to learn different powers. And this ends with all of them on top of a ladder learning to fly. And Scooter is at the bottom instructing them as they recite the passage. I was born to fly. <laughs> the air is my home. And they all jump and crash to the floor below. Uh, Kermit thanks Linda one last time. Uh, and that is what we call the Muppet Show. Hell yeah. So, Jarman, what did you think of of this week's episode with 
guest Linda Carter. Well, first, I was surprised we didn't get a warning like we do in a lot of uh, episodes on Disney Plus for Muppet Show for this very weird like human sacrifice thing that happened at the beginning. It was a lot. There was nothing specifically True. racially like it wasn't targeted at anyone. It's kind of like um, the Temple of Doom with uh, Indiana Jones. It was like a generic random race of yeah, people. Yeah, like generic tribes people. Yeah. Which I don't know if that's better or not. I know. But. I don't either. <laughs> but the statue was really cool. The thing that they made of the statue. That was a great puppet. Yeah. Yeah, like several arms and stuff. That was really neat. Um, honestly, I thought Linda did an amazing job. Um, I think she was a little underutilized. Like she sang two great numbers, but. I could agree with that. She could have done like a skit. Like I think the, some actors and actresses, they do. Like, you know, here's a story of Calamity Jane, and she could have played like Calamity Jane doing a skit, like instead of doing a musical number. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was, it made up for the fact that she was a fantastic singer. Like, I didn't didn't realize Linda Carter could sing, and she's really good. Um, So that was cool. Um, I really enjoyed the backstage plot of all the Muppets trying to become superheroes. That was fun. and That was great. Gives Muppets everywhere. If anything, I wish (laughs) they'd done more of that. Like, I wish we got a, would have gotten more of that and, like, not the backstage scene with Beauregard telling her not to say the name of the Egyptian god. Well, we got the one like, part. That joke didn't need to be played again. The one joke I literally liked, though, with Beauregard was where he's, like, trying to learn x-ray vision. Like, if you do this, you can see through this door. And suddenly Fozzie flies through the door and the door disappears. She's like, I have x-ray yeah, Fozzie, vision. <laughs> Fozzie's learning to swing from a rope. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like that. It was great. Um, I do have x-ray vision. <laughs> And that rubber band uh, number was great. The weird like rubber band band like in the back with the black screen effect. That was kind of cool. Um, and I really liked the really nice chill guitar gently weeps number. It was very sweet and well yeah. sung. And just well done. Um, and I, the sort of standalone number you could put in any episode and it would be a highlight. Of exactly. That episode. Yeah. It's kind of like one of those numbers that just fits it anywhere. They could use it again if they wanted to. Um and Miss Piggy scaring away a giant chicken. I mean, what more could you want? <laughs> she just becomes huge and she scares away a giant chicken. And great effects of the, for the time, making this chicken blend in with like, it even went backstage. Like the chicken went backstage as a huge chicken. It was a real. I had this moment of like, is that a miniature? Why did they do a miniature? And it took me a minute to realize what they were doing. Yeah. But I was like, Jim Henson doesn't do miniatures. What the hell is this? <laughs> it was weird, but it was different. It was cool. <laughs> Um, so basically with all this cool stuff combined, even though they kind of underutilized Linda Carter, because so there are a few scenes where she was like sitting on the side of the stage discussing what was happening on the stage. I'm like, why isn't she just a part of this? Like, why is she sitting on the side of the stage? But besides that, yeah. it, it was still a up, upper level episode for me. This is like probably one of the top of the season for me so far until I rewatch or re look through what we've looked at so far. But this is really good for me. I don't know. What about you? Yeah, I think that, I think this, that my feedback's very much the same. I would have could have used either more Linda Carter Mm -hmm. in more places or maybe one or two Muppet standards. Yeah. Veterinarian's hospital, pigs in space, uh, you know, uh, Henson labs. um, That is what I wrote too. Like, like like last week they put um, Christopher Reeves in, in veterinarian hospital. Like they could have done something like that with Linda Carter, like put her in one of the classic sketches. Yeah. Agreed. Fully agreed. Because that worked really well with Christopher Reeves, and I like they could have done that here as well. So, but I agree, upper level, and she surprised me. Like she was a way better singer than I would have guessed, and also a better actress than she is now. Unfortunately, <laughs> like <laughs> like she was very natural and felt good with the Muppets, and was like a natural singer actress. But I've, both the things we saw on her recently, oh, I've, I've seen her in Supergirl, and then also Sky High. She just doesn't act very naturally anymore. Um, but she was really good and natural in this episode and, and also sexy and hot. So there you go. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, music this week, uh, with little help from my friends uh, from the Beatles, 1976 album, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. For a short time, it had the working title Bad Finger Boogie because John Lennon had hurt his pointer finger and composed the melody on the piano using his middle finger instead while it healed. <laughs> so it was the Bad Finger Boogie. No idea. Rubber, the Rubber Band Man by American band, The Spinners, written by by their producer, Tom Bells. Uh, Tom Bell's son was being teased at school for being overweight. And this song was his homage to his son as a mean to boost his son's ego and self-confidence. It was actually originally titled The Fat Man, oh. uh, but then evolved into Rubber Band Man. <laughs> uh, while My Guitar Gently Weeps, another Beatles song, this one from the White Album. This was written by George Harrison. And while the other Beatles weren't really hot on it and didn't kind of didn't want it, he used it as an excuse to bring in his, one of his friends and collaborators, Eric Clapton. Yeah, on the that's track. right. I forgot about that. Uh, 
The Whiffenpoofs song, named after the Yale Whiffenpoofs, established in 1909. They are the oldest a cappella group in the U.S., mm -hmm. something I didn't know about them. The group replaces every one of its members every year. Wow. It is made up entirely of rising seniors. Most of these seniors take a year-long leave from university, university in order to tour with the group internationally. Wow, because Steve and I were really into some acapella stuff in high school, and we saw we downloaded off Napster several Yale Whip and Poof oh, songs. Yeah, Wind Mix. Yeah, man. We, um, we had yeah, Yale so, Whip and Poof. So being in the Whip and Poofs for most people means doing a five year college run. Wow, that's crazy. Because they take a whole year off to go and tour. Hope they get paid. <laughs> uh, Orange Colored Sky, first published in 1950. It was written by Delug and Stein. And it it wasn't them who made it famous. It was recorded and made popular by Nat King Cole later that year. Mm -hmm. So, Jarman, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? Uh, honestly, it's a little bit of a cop out. But basically, throughout the episode, all of the craziness and chaotic stuff with the superhero madness of all the Muppets trying to take the correspondence course, getting crazier and crazier. Go see them climbing, crawling, running, jumping, and flying all over the set, knocking things over. And like <laughs> that for me was just like that wasn't a planned effort throughout the whole episode. And I thought it was incredibly well done. So I thought that was fun. <laughs> I'm gonna I, I agree. I'm gonna dial in a little bit further, however. I loved the and the Muppets at the top of the ladder, where it's just the ladder sticking straight up and scooter yelling up into the air, and you just hear all their voices above, and they all jump and you just watch them all plummet. <laughs> That's good. I love it. Uh, so, Jarman, what happened on this week's episode of Star Trek, the animated series? All right. This time we have the time trap. And this is the Enterprise exploring and running tests on the Delta Triangle. It's a space Bermuda Triangle, if you will. And when they are attacked by a Klingon ship that is trying um, to mask its destroying of Starfleet vessels, that's just an accident caused by this mysterious triangle. But after being hit by a phaser from the Enterprise in retaliation, the Klingon ship disappears. But then two more Klingon ships arrive, and the Enterprise escapes by traveling to where that ship was that disappeared and also disappearing. And apparently they're sucked into a pocket dimension, and they see tons of starships that are now derelict there and have been there for hundreds of years, some of them. And Kirk and Kor, who is a person we've seen before in the original series, who's the uh, captain of the Klingon ship that attacked them, they are the ones who went into this pocket dimension. They're suddenly transported directly to this council chamber where apparently their weapons don't work. Just core tries to attack with the weapon. It does not work. And they're surprised to be confronted by a council of a uh, multitude of races. Um, all these people who have been stuck here in this pocket dimension for hundreds of years. And they've all stopped. They've stopped all violence of any kind eventually. And any violent act will be punished by a ship and its crew being frozen in time for a hundred years. And they call themselves the Elysian council. And there's Orions and all sorts of other folks we'll talk about later. And Scotty, back in the Enterprise, finds out that the pocket dimension will eventually kill off all their dilithium crystals. So if they're going to get out of here, they got to do it pretty soon. Otherwise, they'll be stuck here forever. And Spock finds a way to get out of the dimension with this equation that he writes, apparently. But they will have to partner with the Klingon ship to get enough power to get out of there together. Basically binding their ships together and blasting their way out of there with their combined power that they have left. And the Kling they meet with the Klingons, and the Klingons agree to do this plan. But Spock suspects they may have sabotage in mind. <laughs> this is the famous episode where you hear Kirk saying sabotage <laughs> with the huge wrong pronunciation. Did you say sabotage? sabotage? And Spock says it correctly multiple times, and then William Shatner continuously says sabotage. Anyways, so the council then throws them a party for some reason for both crews, and they um, – Tell them they might as well get used to being there because over the hundreds of years, everyone's tried to get out and no one has had no one has gotten out. They've all tried. But at the party, a Klingon gets mad at Bones for trying to steal his girl while they're trying to dance and they get in a fight. And the council says that they'll have to pay the hundred year freeze for their violence. But Kirk convinces them to let them at least try their escape in the morning that they already have planned out. So the council agrees to let them try their escape, even though they think it'll be futile. And during the distraction of all that, one of the Klingons plants a bomb in the Enterprise that will go off once they hit warp eight on their way out. So the Klingons would escape this pocket dimension, but blow up the Enterprise in the process. But on their way out the next morning, a psychic on the Council of the Elysians warns the Enterprise about the bomb 
and Spock is able to eject the bomb into space in a hilarious little scene. And then they are, the Klingons escape the pocket dimension with them um, without blowing up the Enterprise. But then the Klingons declare to the galaxy that they were the ones who helped the Enterprise escape, taking the all the credit for that. And Kirk is like, I don't care. It's fine. We got out. That's what matters. We're here in space again. So that's our episode of Time Trap. Steve, what'd you think? Um, I loved the return of the Klingons. Always fun. I loved the like very thinly veiled Bermuda Triangle reference. Yeah, exactly. We can't call it Bermuda. What do we call it? Ah, Delta. Just throw Delta in there. Delta matter. Triangle. Um, I loved the Council of Misfit Aliens. <laughs> Um, I wanted to know, though, why the Vulcan there was dressed like Superman. <laughs> he was. <laughs> um, it was ca- cool to kind of see the Klingons and the Federation working together a little bit. Um, and there was that really out of character moment where Spock gets all buddy buddy and it was really weird. But then they just revealed that he's using his psychic powers to feel him out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, OK, I'm glad they at least explained that weirdness. It was strange. Um, dislikes this. In in a show that has lots of MacGuffins, this one was too many MacGuffins. Hmm. Dilithium is disabled. Oh, there's a disintegrator pill that we've never seen before again. Oh, there's a mad rush to get things done, but for some reason there's time to have a party and drinks. Like, there were too many, like, forced situations that made me go, okay, what is this episode? I could see that. Um, And another thing is the wrap-up was really abrupt. They have the fight at the party. They go to the camp council chamber on charges. Kirk just talks his way out of it. And in less than 10 seconds. And then the weird cat lady with the terrible voice warns them out of nowhere. They find the pill immediately. <laughs> they remove it with zero issue. Um, and it just, that was all like in the last minute and a half. Everything I just said happened in the last minute and a half of this episode. Um. And then I also didn't like that, like, Kirk doesn't care that the, that the Klingons tried to blow them up and then take all the credit because there isn't more time in the episode, I guess. Like, I don't know. There was no reason. I, I guess he doesn't so want to okay escalate tensions between Klingons and the Federation. He's not going to go report back and possibly cause a war or something, I guess. Maybe. But the reason, but the reason he said it was like, yeah, look at those stars. I was like, that's stupid, Kirk. <laughs> and I think you're right about being... Um, kind of rushed at the end because um, even some of these animated series episodes at 23 minutes or whatever the hell they are, some of them even still kind of drag at times. This I feel this episode went bam, 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 bam. Things were happening the whole time. There was no rest. Um, so I feel like they're filling in a lot of plot that could have filled a whole 53-minute episode of the original series and squeezing it into 23 minutes. Especially and, with all those alien races. Absolutely. Yeah. And a party and like all this, these different plot lines going on. Like there was a lot happening in this episode. And I feel like that probably is why the end got short shrifted. Maybe they could have restructured the episode a little bit, but it was just yeah a lot. But I, I, I like that fact that there was just so much happening. I was never bored. It was just bam, 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 bam. Um, but we're getting that a lot in the animated series. So, and, <laughs> um, but yeah, and there's an overarching story. The Klingons, like you said, they returned. Uh, I love Bermuda Triangle in space. Um, this might be one of my favorites of this season. Even though you said they're old conceits, I get what you're saying. But like, it just this was really entertaining and had a lot of Star Trekky things. You know, diplomacy, all these different races working together in that pocket dimension, all these sci-fi aspects. One of my favorites of the season so far. I don't know. Wow. All right. Yeah. Difference of opinion. Is this in your middle Man. bottom? Where does it fall? <laughs> I'm. This is falling middle bottom for me. Truthfully, really? just, too, just between just too many MacGuffins and how quick and unsatisfying the wrap up was. I just I got problems with this. That's one. fair. Totally fair. I get it. I was just I was very entertained. That's why I liked it. And sabotage. That was great. Uh, sabotage. <laughs> so this episode had a little bit more trivia than our most of our animated series episodes, which don't have very much. Uh, many of the vessels in the graveyard of ships were unapproved early designs for the insectoid ship from the episode we earlier reviewed called Beyond the Farthest Star. That um, kind of plant insectoid ship thing? I don't know. Uh, the Council of Elysia includes an Orion woman, a Romulan, a Klingon, a creature that has bat wing ears and looks like the original version of the Zinti, Zinti as they are uh, appeared in illustrations of Larry Niven's known space book franchise, an Andorian, 
an unnoid insectoid race, possibly the inspiration for the Zindi insectoids from the Star Trek Enterprise series, a Philosian from Star Trek the animated series The Infinite Vulcan, I think that's a plant people, an identified okay. human female wearing an environmental helmet with no nose, I remember seeing her, a Vulcan, a Tellarite, a human, and a Gorn. So that was our giant, huge <laughs> incorporation of people there. Uh, this marks the final appearance of the smooth forehead versions of the Klingons. This is the very last time in canon, timeline-wise, that they appear. Um, six years and two weeks later, Star Trek The Motion Picture hit cinemas with a new look for the Klingons. And the look was changed again for Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. And they continue to evolve to this day. But this was the, f- the last in-canon timeline appearance of smooth-head Klingons. Um, and the Shell Nichols, our old Ahura provides the voices of four different characters in this installment, which is pretty crazy. She was she was the really terrible sounding uh, psychic alien as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the second of five appearances of Klingon Commander Kor. He was originally seen in Star Trek Errand of Mercy, the live action series, and later featured in Star Trek Deep Space Nine Blood Oath, uh, Deep Space Nine The Sword of Kalis, Deep Space Nine, once more onto the breach. Although he is played by John uh, Kolikos in all of his live action appearances on all those shows and the original series, same guy played in both. Here he is voiced by James Doohan, who played Scotty because James Kolikos or John Kolikos was not available. Um, and telling J- Jean Roddenberry um, of her idea for the Enterprise's mean for escape, the writer of this episode, Joyce Perry. She says, I remember telling Jean this bizarre notion that two ships could combine engines and become more powerful as one than they were separately. I explained it with a straight face, but was afraid he might laugh me out of his office. Instead, he was quiet for about 30 seconds, then said, that's pretty good. Do it. <laughs> so I like the idea. It's like they had to combine their power to work together and it worked out well. And the last one, uh, the fact that Kor commanded the IKS Clothos. That was the ship that he was on. We saw the name of it on the side of his ship. It's one of the several facts from the animated series that later became official canon because it was later mentioned on Star Trek Deep Space Nine that Kor used to captain the Clothos. And that was only mentioned in this animated series episode. So that's pretty cool. But this is a canon uh, installment, basically. Hmm. All right. So, Steve, what are our Trek connection Muppet connections this week? Well, I got some doozies for you. When Shatner went to the moon... Him and Linda Carter shared a nice Twitter exchange. Oh, she said, "Congrats, William Shatner! If you really get to go to space, I hope I can really figure out how to get an invisible plane." Wow, that is a very modern, uh, current events kind of connection there. <laughs> uh, well, you're gonna love this next one. Then Linda also honored Nichelle Nichols on Twitter in her relatively recent passing, writing, mm. "Many actors become stars, but few stars can move a nation." Nichelle Nichols showed us the extraordinary power of black women and paved the way for a better future for all women in media. Thank you, Nichelle. We will miss you. Linda Carter's a gem. I love her. Uh, (laughs) And then Starlog Magazine, which I hadn't heard of until now, was originally a Star Trek-driven magazine publication, (laughs) but later turned to cover all sorts of Mm sci-fi. And they released in 1978 an issue of all sci-fi posters – and among them were Linda Carter as Wonder Woman, as well as Christopher Reeve as Superman. Ha, our last two of a trick episodes. That's right. And if you want to listen to more about Starlog, uh, listen to this, the Trek Files podcast hosted by Lem- Larry Nemechek. He interviews the creator of Starlog. And I know so much about Starlog. It's, it's, it's uh, unfortunate. <laughs> wow. That is unfortunate. <laughs> but not as unfortunate as how similar these episodes were. Oh, same episode, man. Same, Same episode. Right. I mean, both have a set of people that have to escape being trapped in a small space. We have the pigs Ooh, from the okay. house being attacked by the giant chicken and the Enterprise from the pocket dimension. Uh, both feature wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> the Klingons pretending to be allies only to betray them in the end. And the literal wolf in sheep's clothes in the Muppet show in the Whiff and Poof song number. That's great. Cause that's similar to my uh, second one. Uh, both have instances where someone thought they could censor a race from their negative ways. Uh, Sam the Eagle tries to send the rats away and censor them from the show, but they come back and throw him the dumpster. <laughs> and the Elysians <laughs> thought they could censor the violence from the Klingons, but the Klingons try to double cross the Enterprise and blow it up. <laughs> All right. 
Both feature people, groups of people working together to achieve something seemingly impossible. The crew and the Klingons being the first to escape the uh, Delta Triangle and all of the wannabe heroes in training jumping off the ladder together in order to fly. That's an exact similarity. I just, same episode. Deep. Deep. <laughs> oh, what's that noise? Transporter ah, malfunction. Ah. Transporter malfunction. All right, it's the part of the episode where we transport one character from one episode to the other and vice versa. What you got for us, Steve? This week, Trek to Muppets, I'm going to bring over the Snake Eye Lady with a weird voice and replace Sam the Eagle, just eerily standing backstage, warning Linda of the grim portents of the episode to come <laughs> and trying to warn her away. Uh, the next joke will be terrible. <laughs> I had something similar. I have the weird psychic alien who apparently was called <laughs> Megan. <laughs> that was her name. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Was going to trade places with Linda Carter. So she'd sing her two musical numbers in that terrible, weird voice she used. <laughs> <laughs> you never heard the sound like the rubber band. That's bad. Rubber band. Man. <laughs> Hand me down my walking cane. Hand me down my hat. <laughs> <laughs> I portend it. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. Of Ocean Trek, I'm going to bring over all the superhero Muppet wannabes and replace the Council of Lost Aliens because the outfits were eerily similar. <laughs> that works really well. Right? Just imagine all of them, those crazy <laughs> outfits sitting around a table. And they're also different races, so it works out. <laughs> right. They're basically all Star Trek aliens. Yeah. Uh, Muppets of Trek, I'm going to have the giant chicken replace the Klingon war vessel. <laughs> So it pursues the Enterprise into the pocket dimension and, and has to stop being violent long enough to escape with them. I mean, that's the real Klingon bird of prey. Exactly. A giant chicken. And and Gonzo is so horny right now. He, lo- he likes the big chickens. So that brings us to the end of episode 92 of the Muppet Trek podcast. Join us next time for The Muppet Show with special guest Alan Arkin. An animated, ep- animated series episode, The Ambergus Experiment. What, how do you pronounce it, Steve? Amber Gris. Amber Gris experiment. <laughs> uh, so from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek Podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. 